In this video, we're going to start talking about the material in chapter 11, which focuses on infinite sequences and in series. So I wanted to give you a little bit of motivation for why we're going to be studying these sequences and series. Um, one of the really important applications of infinite series is to something called Taylor series, um, which allow us to represent all kinds of functions, things like sine x, log x, e to the x, as essentially sums of um, infinitely long polynomials. So we really like polynomials, they're really nice and easy to work with. Um, functions like e to the x sine x log x can be a little bit uglier, so what um, Taylor series allow us to do is to take some of these more involved functions here and express them as these really long polynomials. So to give you an idea of what this um, looks like, I want to show you the following demonstration. So here I have the graph of cosine x. Um, remember that one of the things you learned in Calc 1 was that we could do tangent line approximations. So here I have uh, the tangent line to 0 on my cosine curve. Um, but what we're going to learn is that we can get better approximations of the curve over bigger and bigger um, areas by adding more terms here. So if I have um, 1 minus x squared over 2 here, this is a nice quadratic approximation. And as we would add more and more terms here, I would be getting a better and better approximation. So when I have just n terms here, that's what we're going to call a Taylor polynomial that we'll learn about later. But you can think about adding more and more terms infinitely many times, and the idea of that will be this um, Taylor series approximation to this cosine function. So it's just a sum of lots and lots of powers of x. So we'll have this idea of this um, Taylor polynomial converging to this cosine function. Just to give you another example here, if I have this curve 1 over x plus 1, okay, if I go back here starting with the linear approximation, and then notice as I add more terms here, I'm getting a better approximation to the curve, but it's not actually over the whole interval like it was for, for the cosine function. It looks like I'm just getting a better approximation in this small little interval. So questions about when this sort of long, infinitely long sum converges to my, my function are going to be questions that we're interested in answering within this um, section. When do these things converge, over what intervals, and, and those kinds of things. So this just gives you a little bit of idea of what we're going to be building towards, but we're going to need a lot of different tools um, built earlier in this chapter in order to understand those, those Taylor series. So this is just summarizing some of the ways that Taylor series are used. So we talked about um, working with our different functions like e to the x and sine x using um, just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Thinking about what you would use just in summing up powers of x with some coefficients. Um, it's useful for solving differential equations, um, for doing certain approximations um, that come up in physics and chemistry. And you can also think about these um, infinite sums that we're going to be looking at as being useful to represent numbers like pi and e and repeating decimals. So those are just some of the applications that we're going to see. So before we can we can get to that material later in this chapter, first we need to understand some basics. So we need to understand the difference between a sequence and a series. I said that this chapter is going to focus on sequences and series. So what do we mean um, by these particular terms here? Well, a sequence means an infinite ordered list of numbers. Okay, so you could have a sequence that was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Um, other maybe examples of sequences, you could think of 2, 4, 6, 8. You could think of a sequence like 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, etc. The idea is that we just have a list of numbers that goes on and on and on and on. A series, on the other hand, is an infinite sum of numbers. Okay, so a sequence is just this list of numbers. The series would be if I added up those numbers. So you could think of something like 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8, etc. 
or something like one half plus one fourth plus one eighth, etc. Okay, and in both of these um, situations, dealing with sequences and dealing with series, we'll be interested in the idea of convergence. So we've already been um, exposed to the idea of convergence with our improper integrals. Okay, but convergence will be the big question with both sequences and series. So I just want to outline. Um, how we're going to determine convergence in the sequences case versus the series case. So with sequences, what we're going to see is that we'll be able to use the same tools for determining convergence of a sequence as for limits at infinity of functions. So we remember um, in Calc 1, we would sometimes compute things. The limit as x goes to infinity of some function f of x. That's going to be the idea that we'll use with sequences. With series, though, we're going to need um, a whole bunch of new techniques to determine um, when a series and infinite sum converges and when it doesn't converge. Okay, So you'll see that a big focus of this section will be on techniques for dealing with convergence of series, whereas just the first section of this chapter talks about convergence of sequences. Okay, so the, for the remaining part of this um, video, we're going to be focusing on some examples and definitions associated with our sequences. So here we have a few more examples of sequences. I'm going to comment on some of the, the notation here and alternate types of notation that we might see. So here I have a list of numbers. These curly braces here are part of the notation. Okay, for saying that that's a, um, a particular sequence with that list of numbers. Another way for me to express that same sequence would be to write a formula for the nth term in that sequence. And it turns out for this sequence that would be 1 plus 3n. And n here is my index. Okay, and it looks like my sequence here with it starting at 1, that would mean with the form 1 plus 3n, okay, I would get my values starting with 0, starting with integers that begin at 0. So I have an is 1 plus 3n for n greater than or equal to 0. That gives me when n is 0, I get 1. When n is 1, I get 4. When n is 2, I get 7, exactly like I see in that list. Okay. Another way you might see that same sequence expressed could be something like 1 plus 3n in the curly braces from n equals 0 to infinity. Okay. So here's another um, sequence given to us. I have this 1 over 2 to the n in curly braces from n equals 1 to infinity. This is saying plug in 1 first here for the first term, so I get 1 half. Then plug in 2, we'd have 1 fourth, plug in 3, 1 eighth, etc. Okay, so I can convert from this version of um, having the nth term um, formula given to me to writing out a list of the um, terms in that sequence. Okay, I could also just have something that says an equals 1 over 2 to the n here, where n is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, a lot of times you'll see things expressed with just a n equals something that we'll want to analyze in terms of uh, whether that sequence converges or diverges. And one more example here. This is now giving you in the a n form. So I have the nth um, term of the sequence is negative 1 to the n for n greater than or equal to 1. So if we wanted to see what this sequence is, well, if I plug in 1 for n, that would be negative 1. Plug in 2, I'd get positive 1. Plug in 3, I get negative 1. So this is a sequence that alternates back and forth between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so that just gives you a variety of some of the, the notation we might see associated with our sequences. So before we get to one um, definition, I just want to look at one more example. Or maybe we have to do a little bit of work to figure out a formula for the nth term of the sequence, assuming our, our pattern continues. So notice here that I have a, this sequence that's negative 3, 2, negative 4 thirds, 8 ninths, negative 16 over 27, etc. So I'm trying to identify what the pattern is here. 
Well, maybe it's a little hard to tell with the first two terms, but look, starting from the third term on, it looks like I've got um, powers of 2 in the numerator and powers of 3 in the denominator. It looks like I've got negative 2 squared over 3 to the first, and then 2 cubed over 3 to the second, and then maybe negative 2 to the fourth over 3 cubed. So let's see if I, I can get these other two values here following that pattern. It looks like I decrease the power of 2 by 1 and decrease the power of 3 by 1. So let's see, is this 2 to the 1 over 3 to the 0? Now that would give me 2 because 3 to the 0 is 1 and 2 to the 1 is 2. If I do this again, I'd have 2 to the 0 over 3 to the negative 1. It looks like the signs here are alternating 2. Notice that this negative 2 to the 0 over 3 to the negative 1 would come out to negative 3. Okay. So it looks like my a n here is going to be 2, let's say, to the n over, it looks like the power for 3 um, in the denominator there is 1 less, so over 3 to the n minus 1. Okay, and what do I need n to start with? Well, if I'm going to um, decide to make the power of 2n here, and I need the first term in my whole sequence to be 2 to the 0, this will be for n greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so now I just have to deal with the fact that I have these alternating signs occurring. Okay, so I'm going to need some sort of negative 1 to a power in front of this. Um, but I want to make sure that when n is 0, I'm going to get back a negative 1. So I don't want to have negative 1 to the n, because if I had that, when n equals 0, negative 1 to the 0 would equal 1, which would make my first term positive. So instead, we can do negative 1 to the n plus 1. So I have this an equals negative 1 to the n plus 1, so that when n is 0, I would get negative 1. When n is 1, I would get positive 1, so that would give me the right alternating pattern of signs. Okay. Now, this is not the only way to express the nth term. If you'd wanted your indexes to start at 1 or at negative 1, you could have had some different variations here. So just to note some other things that would have been correct, I could have an is negative 1 to the n times 2 to the n plus 1, all over 3 to the n, for n greater than or equal to negative 1. I could have a n equals negative 1 to the n, 2 to the n minus 1, all over 3 to the n minus 2, for n greater than or equal to 1. Okay, And there would be many other possibilities, but this is just to illustrate that um, there are multiple correct answers to this, this problem, depending on where you were going to start your index. Okay, So we've got an idea of some examples, how we might be able to find um, a formula for the nth term. So let's talk about the, the definition of um, convergence of a sequence now. So when we're talking about the limit of a sequence, okay, we mean that a sequence, a n, has limit l, and we'll use this notation, the limit as um, n goes to infinity of a n is l, if we can make the terms of a n as close to l as we like by taking n sufficiently large. Okay, so that means that thinking about your list of terms, that far out in the list, um, for a large value of n, you'll be getting closer and closer to a particular value l. Okay, so here's the terminology that goes with this. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n exists, okay, as a finite number, we say the sequence converges. So remember, just like with our improper integrals, we said that the improper integral converged if the, the limit that was equal to our improper integral was um, existing as a finite number. And then otherwise, we say that the sequence diverges. Okay, so just to give you a couple of pictures to go with this, some different ways in which a limit might um, converge or, or a sequence might converge. 
we could have something, and one way we can plot our sequences is as just some points, okay? Because I have at certain um, n values, I have some particular value a n of the sequence. So you could have a sequence that sort of increases up and then levels off and approaches some value l. You could have a sequence that decreases to l. You could have something that increases and then decreases to your limit value L. You could also have something that oscillates, but it gets smaller and smaller oscillations at some point, and so it gets closer and closer to some value L. Okay, so those are all examples of just giving you some pictures of ways the sequence could converge. Okay. So what about maybe a couple of examples of what it looks like when a sequence diverges? Well, you could have a sequence that's just increasing up and up and up and up. Okay. So that sequence would diverge. You could have something that's just keeps decreasing. It doesn't level off. Okay. Or you could have something that just bounces around. Okay. So this would also diverge, okay, due to, to oscillation. Okay. Think about the, the sequence that we had that was negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one, one that's not getting closer to any particular value, that would be a divergent sequence. Okay, so how are we going to actually write down some calculations? We have these pictures that give us an idea of what might be going on, but what are the calculations gonna look like for sequence convergence? Well, we have the following theorem and limit laws that we'll be using. So this theorem talks about how we can use the limit of a function to find the limit of a sequence. This is saying that if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is l, and f of n equals a n, okay, so that means that we can um, think about our, our sequence points as being basically the subset of a function. So, you know, I was drawing something like this for my sequence, but maybe that's some subset of a function whose limit we can find. Okay, so if the limit as x goes to infinity of the function is l, then the limit as n goes to infinity of our sequence a n will also be l. Okay, so this is what allows us to use all the, the properties that we had for dealing with limits of functions and apply them to the limits of our, our sequences. Okay, so this just summarizes the limit laws that we have for sequences. I wouldn't, um, think about having to memorize these per se because these, these laws should be familiar from dealing with functions and they're also sort of what you would expect to be true for the limits of your sequences. They shouldn't be too surprising. Um, note that these laws are specifically for convergent sequences. Um, if you had some individual sequences that both diverged or one of them diverged, then you could kind of have some weird stuff happen when you start looking at limits of their sums or differences or products or things. But if they both converge, then the limit of the sum of those sequences could be the sum of each of the individual limits, or the limit of the difference is the, um, the difference of those two limits. If we have a constant times our sequence, we can pull that constant out in front of our limit. Limit of a constant is still a constant, as n goes to infinity. Limit of a product could be the product of the limits. Limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, as long as that denominator is not zero. And then if we have things like the limit of our sequence to a power, we can bring that limit inside and have the limit raised to the power, as long as we're dealing with some um, positive powers here with uh, our sequences greater than zero. Okay, so remember that's specifically for convergent sequences. But in the um, upcoming videos, we'll look at applying these limit laws to some um, basic sequence convergence problems, and then we'll introduce a few more theorems and do some additional examples with sequence convergence.